Warning, the audio you are about to hear is best played at maximum volume while you and your partner are making love. This is Gorilla Roundtable. With us this week are Mike, an MBA and free market enthusiast, Nick, a PhD and political economist, Paul, a neuroscience graduate student concentrating on addiction and humanity in general, and Kyle, fluent in sarcasm and lover of wine and cheese. On this week's episode, Nuclear Iran, Telemedicine, the AR-15 bullet ban, and MH-17 shoot down as the conspiracy of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the gang of Gorilla Round Table. Folks, welcome to episode 7 of Gorilla Round Table. I am Mike. I'm Nick. I'm Paul. This is Kyle. So guys, how are we doing this week? Doing good, Mike. Nick, how's the Twitter doing? Oh, Mike, we are doing real good. We had some good discussion going on last week, a bit of a hubbub about Venezuela. Uh, we are still attracting followers in mass. I think we're closing in on 100. Uh, I just want to say, you know, my personal favorite this week, we had a good one about uh, an interesting study that shows having children makes parents behave more unethically in a wide range of situations where, you know, advancing their child is at stake. So... Interesting stuff. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. You won't miss a beat about our exploits and discussions, so tune in. I'd also agree, Nick, that, you know, parents make children more unethical merely by raising them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, either way, so uh, check us out also on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, and we got a lot of followers on there as well. And we also have uh, a website that is in the works right now. So when we get that thing done, we're going to roll it out to you. So, Kyle, tech- you you are joining us this week. Welcome. Yes, welcome, one of welcome. the new Twitter followers, actually. Thank you. Oh, look at that. I started oh. following this week. Boosh. I did. We, we are on our way to triple-digit Twitter followers. I know, because I think I have like five people that follow me, so that's like a big deal for you guys. Hey, that's a big deal. You guys heard about this Maryland bus driver arrested for DWI on the way to pick up kids for a field trip? Down in Washington, D.C.? I missed oh, that, that one. sounds great. That's, I missed it, too. That's crazy, man. And, and the kid was, or excuse me, the driver was swerving all over the road. The police pulled the bus over, which it must be odd to see a school bus pulled over. And they went on the bus, and there was open containers of liquor. So, I, I don't know. To, to me, it was just very surreal and bizarre that this even went down this week. Well, you know, maybe the field trip was to, like, the De- the Jack Daniels distillery. So you're yeah. trying to set the scene, you know. Or, yeah. or it could have been Otto from The Simpsons. You yeah, know? there you go. Hey, That's... man. <laughs> Otto <laughs> wants to get really black. Otto. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first thought. And uh, what about Gary Kasparov uh, and his comments on Twitter uh, regarding that. What happened? Boris Nemtsov? Uh, oh, boy, Boris Nemtsov was was a uh, opposition leader, you know, the quote-unquote opposition leader. He, he had a lot to say about Putin. He was very... Uh, uh, integral in some free market reforms in the 90s in Russia, uh, and he was assassinated on a bridge, uh, you know, within with the Kremlin in view. So Mr. Kasparov uh, has taken to Twitter with some blistering commentary on Putin, uh, basically blaming him, you know, saying if, if Putin really has 85 percent or 86 percent of public support, why is this guy dead? Uh, he basically said Putin has oceans of blood on his hands. So, you know, Kasparov has really become a, a political voice in recent years. He's got lots of comments on Twitter. He's very outspoken on global politics. You know, it kind of makes you wonder, Nick, what do you think he'd say about the timing on a potential nuclear deal with Iran? Bishop to night four. I mean, <laughs> what would Kasparov? I have no idea what Kasparov would That's a clever say. chess joke, Nick. <laughs> I, I, well, that's what we're aiming to do here, right? Clever, uh, clever banter. That's a joke every day, you know? <laughs> well, between Kasparov and Fisher, it's, at least Kasparov, I'm much more likely to listen to. Can I just say, like, I've, I've been saving that one. I've had that one in the chamber the whole time. For, for years <laughs> before we even did this show. <laughs> years and years I've been waiting to get a Kasparov joke in there. <laughs> Stayed up all night writing it. <laughs> well, now Kasparov's going to be following Gorilla Roundtable, so thank you. Yeah, please, Kasparov, Kasparov follow Gorilla Roundtable. So, it's, well, again, so speaking of, yeah, of a nuclear deal, right? I'm interested in the one that we are, we, the United States, are currently negotiating with, uh, Iran. And I know that this is something that has certainly been 
in the press, you know, not a lot, but certainly it's one of the bigger foreign policy issues on on the president's agenda. Um, and so, you know, the, the kind of the talks now are in overtime, to put it that way. Um, Bibi Netanyahu, the Biebs, as I like to call him, Beep. the real Biebs. Uh, he's coming to speak to Congress this week about Iran. Um, you know, so the, the, you know, the talks are at a real sort of crucial stage. We haven't really made a lot of progress. You know, I mean, of course, everyone has been kind of tight lipped and about what is on the table, what is not on the table, what, um, you know, so really the outlines of a deal are, are unclear. You know, in general, you can say things like, well, look, um, the U.S. and the West, they kind of want, you know, non-proliferation. They don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, right? They kind of want Israeli military supremacy in the region. Iran, on the other hand, right, they want national sovereignty. They want to exercise legal treaty rights. Um, you know, I, I guess what I want to – my beef with this is just I, I want to see a deal happen. I think we need to make a deal with Iran. We need to put behind us this, you know, 35-plus years of, of bad blood that, of course, you know – we look at look at the history. We definitely helped create. Um, you know, it's time for a new page. I, I don't think Iran is asking for anything um, that's you know too much. I mean, again, they're asking for things that they are legally entitled to under various international treaties and conventions. And on the other hand, I, I guess I just think it's a bit racist to me, or it's a bit condescending and imperialist for the the nuclear powers to say, well, you know, look, we're capable of of having nukes and being responsible and being good actors, but, you know, you Iranians are too crazy, you're too, you know, you're too this, you're too that. You know, I, and again, look, look what we did to Assad, look what we did to Saddam. Chemical weapons are not going to cut it in the Middle East. You know, wanting a nuke seems pretty rational for, um, you know, domestic security. Uh, you know, so I guess, you know, something, Mike, I, I would just want to ask you, right, should we be even making a deal with Iran? And I know there's plenty of people who would say, who would say no? You know, I would be one of those people, but let me give you the caveat. Not if it comes at the cost of our relationship with Israel. And they've been our entry point into that region. We share in intelligence with them. I don't foresee a situation where we are endorsing, if you will, in Iranian uranium enrichment. Try saying that 10 times fast and losing Israel as a partner and, and somehow that being advantageous to global security with specific regard to the security of the United States. Interesting. You know, I, uh, so it's interesting, Paul, this is what I want to I talk to you about, right? Are, how worried are you about a nuclear-armed Iran, right? Right, Pakistan, India, they have nukes. They're at each other's throats constantly, right? Pakistan, you would not ter- call a uh, a stable country, right? Russia has nukes, and they're aggressively in... In, in Ukraine right now, they feel threatened. You know, I, I don't think any people joke all the time about how crazy they think Putin is. Um, right? Are you really that worried about Iran joining the, the nuclear club? No, I really am not, Nick. And it's a good question. I think that generally speaking, well, aside from the recent intelligence reports that were leaked about whether or not Iran actually has the capability to produce nukes or is actively producing nukes, rather, I'm still not as worried about Iran as I would be about, you know, a country like Russia, for example, especially as we go into the 21st century and as, you know, Russia continues to actively engage other nations uh, like Ukraine, for example. You know, of course, behind this cloak that Putin has put up that uh, that no one really believes. But uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. This report, there was declassified information. Uh, Mossad actually found that Iran is not, you know, actively proliferating a nuclear program. This is in contrast to what Netanyahu said uh, a couple of years ago. But, yeah, I think uh, the other point I want to make on this issue is that, you know, no, I'm not worried about Iran in particular. I think people should be much more worried, uh, not necessarily about the nuclear proliferation, but about the fact that, uh, you know, you have ISIS and you have um, – other uh, militant uh, is- Islamic groups in the region that are essentially eschewing the fact that these nations, Iran, Iraq, that there's borders at all. So we're not talking about a level of war where it's you know one nation one- with a single set of borders. We're talking about uh, enemies now that are established throughout across borders, and you can't just take one government. I think it's a little bit uh, we're a little bit past that. It's a little bit obsolete. Oh, I think you're right. It's it's definitely a, a patchwork of different conflicts. Uh, I mean, Kyle, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you think. I mean, if Paul is right and, and this Mossad report spy cable thing is, 
is true and, and Iran is not pursuing a nuclear weapon, then why shouldn't we make a deal with them? Um, so I kind of, I, I mean, I've, I've read those reports. I've seen that. I think it really goes back to intent. I think when you look at the Iranian model of revolution, institution of Islamic law, anti-Western philosophy, they're basically building the rhetoric for all these extremist groups. And Iranian money is often paid for a lot of this. So my fear is more on the the, the what it leads to and the people that have followed it. You know, as compared to Pakistan and India, you know, they're pointing at each other, but they're not necessarily trying to annihilate a whole race of people or they're not trying to necessarily say that everybody but us has to go. You know, Pakistan's worried about energy. India's worried about energy. Same, you know, that's where I feel like they're comparable and we can look at it. But I just don't feel like they're as driven. I mean, there are quotes after quotes after quotes from, you know, Iranian leaders saying how they will level and they will demolish and get rid of Israel. So I think that that's where we, we take a look at it and say, what, what's the chain effect from there? You know, and I think there's been increasing attacks on Americans. There's funding more militants and providing safe haven, you know, for senior terrorist leaders. And I think it's more the, you know, I get the whole racist and the, the, the argument of saying, yeah, you can have it, but you can't. But I think time after time, we did make them our enemies. I mean, they wouldn't, they loved us. Iranians loved us up until we decided to come in and get rid of their number one leader for democracy. And ever since then, you know, they can't understand why. They loved everything about America. They wanted to be a democratic and free and we're going after that. And then when we came in and got rid of all the people who were leading them, I mean, that's when they said, nope, no more. And I think that's where we gave root to all of this other terrorist activities to start to grow. So personally, yes, I would rather us not have any sort of nuclear uh, Iran. I'd rather it not be armed. I don't know that they're actually worried about protecting themselves so much as they are about attacking other people. So interesting. I mean, it's interesting that you bring up Israel, which I mean, to me, of course, is the the wild card here. I mean, they have, have they have nuclear weapons. I mean, not officially, of course. I mean, as usually is the case with Israel, everything is cr- crowded in, uh, uh, you know, a lot of secrecy. And I think this creates, you know, a, a very obvious imbalance in terms of military power in the region. Um, you know, and again, in light of decades of U.S. intervention there, it, it does seem that there might be some, I mean, I think there's, I think there's personally a great deal of hypocrisy. Um, but it's easy to see why there would be the perception of that when we support a nuclear armed Israel, but not a nuclear armed anyone else that we, you know, that we actively sabotage anyone else looking for the ability to rival uh, Israel, right? So this looks to me like one of those policy stances that really gives the U.S. and the West in general a bad image in the region. And uh, I'm kind of curious, Mike, if you know if you see as much hypocrisy in this kind of stance as I do. Well, the U.S. really has no image to protect in the region. I mean, in in, in all reality, our entire role there is questionable at best. Uh, the U.S. supports Israel, like I said before. We share intelligence in the region. If that relationship get damaged, who's going to take that place? Iran? I, I doubt that's going to be the case. The end game is going to result in uh, o- Obama's interference abroad, causing a nuclear arms race in, in a very, very unpredictable region. Another administration, maybe they could do this, but with this crew of misfits, maybe they better leave it alone. I mean, do we want a deal that limits Iranian enrichment to nuclear power? Sure we do. I mean, that's, you know, nobody wants to begrudge them the ability to, to have nuclear plants and get energy. But I think in the heart of the matter, everybody knows they're going to build weapons. I don't think when they say they're not going to, there's not a person on the planet who thinks that's credible. So if if we know they're going to go that route ultimately, despite what they say, I, I think we want guarantees of some sort. And, and I don't know that this administration is the, the administration that is going to negotiate something strong enough for people to have confidence that it's not going to have a terrible and dangerous result. Interesting. So, I mean, I'm curious, Paul, I mean, like, do, what do you think? I mean, right, are we, does, do we, do we have an image to protect? I mean, have we given ourselves such a bad name already that, I mean, there's really no hope of recovering, you know, any kind of good name? Right. It's very complicated out in, in the Middle East, of course, and it always has been and it probably always will be. But in terms of the U.S., I think, I think, I think Mike's, Mike's right. You know, the U.S. essentially has a pretty bad image as, as it is. The diplomatic relations are not going to necessarily improve how the U.S. is seen in the Middle East, with the exception of if, if the U.S. intervenes as little as possible, you know, pulls troops out, with the exception of uh, protecting economic interests, which, you know, might be um, something that you can't disentangle. But, you know, my thought is that if the U.S. can, 
you know, kind of pull out influence in the region and can also kind of be fair in terms of uh, how it treats issues that are surrounding Israel and the Arab states in the region. Uh, that's the only way that, you know, the U.S. could establish any sort of image in the region, I think, and, um, and might uh, be able to foster in the end some sort of uh, peace in the end without seeming like it's everyone's father. So, I mean, that's interesting, uh, Paul. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk about this a lot more. You know, we could really go all day, you know. But while the talks yeah. with Iran about this deal have been conducted face-to-face, you know, like most high-level diplomacy usually is, you know, Paul wants to talk about a different kind of high-level discussion, uh, those that usually occur between doctors and patients. Uh, and these are increasingly being conducted across long distances. So, Paul, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell us more? Yeah, definitely. So the topic I want to talk about today is called uh, telemedicine. And have you guys heard of this this idea of telemedicine? I've used it. You've oh, used it? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, so we got one user and two guys who potentially heard about it. But let me tell you a little bit more about it. So telemedicine is kind of what it sounds like. It's, it's the administration of medicine uh, over distances. And with the use of technology, with the use of video phones and other, you know, kind of robotic technology where doctors are able to uh, both assess the history of a patient, uh, communicate with them about their symptoms, and even in some cases intervene or have them send uh, samples or uh, have analyzers detect what's in those samples and then send the data uh, immediately to doctors in different regions. All right, and so telemedicine is essentially, we all know that uh, the economics of medicine is completely overrun. Doctors are busy up to their eyeballs trying to schedule patients in. If you want to get an appointment, you can't get in for uh, you know for weeks and for for months in some cases. So it's a response to both rising healthcare costs and uh, and a lot of patients who need treatment, and it also will eliminate distance barriers, particularly for patients in rural areas. Now, um, with that said. Uh, One of the major issues that's going on with telemedicine is that physicians are often required to practice across state lines, right, especially in rural regions, uh, Pacific Northwest, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, areas like this. Um, But the problem is is that all medical licenses for the past 100 years have been state statewide, right? So you have to, if you want to practice in a particular state, uh, you need to get a license by that state, and other state licenses can't um, can't really cover that classically. And so um, what this involves, getting a license, it's not just as simple as going down to the DMV and waiting in line and taking a test. It, it takes a lot of time, months. you got to provide evidence of credentials, in some cases more than that. Lots of fees, lots of interviews that you have to do. In the meantime, your patients could be being treated, right? And so there might not be that much difference between uh, what one state requires and what another state requires. And so um, essentially there was a report, a review that just came out that Mike made me aware of recently where um, uh, they surveyed a bunch of doctors who are giving uh, telemedicine, and it's a big problem. There's uh, when these doctors try to get try to apply for licenses in multiple states, they really kind of get shut down a lot in a lot of cases. There's kind of bureaucratic problems that prevent them from being able to get these licenses, and so. Um, Essentially, there's other coverage issues that are involved in telemedicine. There's only a couple health insurers that actually uh, will cover this type. Uh, only about half of Medicaid programs will reimburse for telerehabilitation services, for example. And so what the survey showed is essentially more than half of people, 79% uh, in this process of trying to get a license, experienced their documents that they were submitting to the other states that were actually lost in the process. So it's incredibly insufficient, uh, inefficient rather, uh, and this process is is demanding, and the physicians who are doing this are demanding uh, resolutions. And one of those possible resolutions is um, the idea of having a universal license, you know, federal license for practicing medicine, um, which might take substantial legislation in order to to get going. So um, I actually agree with this, and we can discuss the reasons a little bit, but uh, Mike, I wanted to ask you first, in terms of uh, thinking about states' rights versus a federal license, uh, what drawbacks of a federal license for uh, telemedicine and maybe for medicine in general would you foresee, Mike? Well, let me tell you, Paul, I love the idea of telemedicine. I don't necessarily support a federal license versus a multi-state compact because I feel like, I mean, this is something that states have traditionally done and states know the best how to negotiate their positions with the other states. However, if they were absolutely unable to get it done. I think of all the reasons to have any kind of federal licensing, this is definitely one of them. However, the the problems I see with this right from the jump is you'd first need to enact some kind of federal tort reform. 
you'd need to enact some kind of federal insurance standards. Uh, and, and again, these are all roles that the states have traditionally played. I tend to have my default position set to be against federal involvement, and I will reiterate that. If the states can get this done, then I would like to see them get it done, as opposed to having the federal government come in and, and administer some kind of federal license. In the end, I think you get the same result, but with much less federal oversight. Good points. And I mean, it, it, yeah, it goes to show there's also um, uh, specifics in which, you know, it's not happening in all, across all state lines. It might be selective to a certain patient population in a certain region um, that might be specific to a few states. But, um, Kyle, I wanted to ask you, uh, we know that doctors are sued all the time. Uh, this is just part of the practice. There's overhead medical malpractice costs that are built into every individual physician's insurance plan. It makes up a huge amount of our health care costs in general as people in, uh, initiating lawsuits and then being carried out. So if there were to be a federal license or um, maybe taking a, ju- a step back considering telemedicine in general, uh, how do you think this whole – things going to play out in terms of uh, potential lawsuits because those are generally within the states um how do you think how do you think this might work Kyle? so i think there's always going to be jerks <laughs> that are around <laughs> and there's always going to be people suing <laughs> i you know for me personally i think that uh telemedicine's actually been around for a while i mean it's it's in some form, it has been. Now, obviously, in the past couple of years with cameras and webcams and being able to share a whole lot faster, it's obviously gotten more and more popular. But I kind of feel like you waive a certain right when you elect to do something like this. You are taking the cost savings and you're taking the increased access. And, you know, if, if the doctor misses something because I'm not willing to go into them or I feel like this is a better way to do it, then some of that responsibility has to fall on me. I think, unfortunately, our government doesn't support you know, responsibility falling on individuals like it should. Um, but from what I've seen and some of the things I've looked at, the lawsuits uh, actually been pretty low in the in the virtual patients. They the insurance companies haven't seen a lot arising specifically from a virtual patient. Um, I think it's hard to say that when you're letting a doctor increase communication capabilities with your patient, that doesn't really damage the standard medical practice. You know, I mean, just because he can talk to me on four different levels now, I mean. That's, that's a little bit better for him and have better access. So Very I think it points. can even be a standard of care that people are going to be opposed if you don't have it, and you might see litigation from that. Very good points. Very good points. So if we take it to the extreme where, you know, maybe we're taking humans out of the equation, Nick, I wanted to ask you, is um, telemedicine, or at least as Kyle pointed out, it's not necessarily a new thing, but it's clearly our technology is allowing it to be practiced in different ways. So is this maybe the proliferation of technology associated with it? Is this kind of a step closer to having, you know, robots give us our medical care instead of human beings? And what do you think about that? Oh, I mean, it definitely, uh, I mean, it's certainly a step in that direction. You know, I mean, the more you give people and in this case, doctors. I mean, the more you in, you sort of give the, the uh, people with specialized skills the ability to work remotely. You know, surgeons, for example, to perform operations right potentially from across the country and things like that. You know, I think that's definitely the case. I think that's only you know just another manifestation right. of the general trend in the economy towards you know robotization, automation. Right. Uh, you know, whether this is through you know, digital software, like the kind of, you know, the, the ubiquitous, uh, you know, phone operating systems now. I mean, you know, I, you know, even when I was a kid that you, you could call people and there, there were still humans. Um, right. you know, so again, this is just another part and parcel of the, you know, again, the larger economic process of capitalists replacing the organic composition of labor with increasing amounts of machine labor to maintain, you know, the profits upon which surpluses are, are based. Correct, and we could talk about that, I'm sure, all day. And yes, yeah, so certainly there's a distinction to be made between right whether a surgeon is operating a robot in the same room or even across the country versus a robot who has an algorithm decide that that's designed to take your history and then determine the, the best course of treatment. But let's back up a second. So, um, Mike, I wanted to ask you uh, in general. So I already know your thoughts about, you know, the potential for a national um, national licensure system. Even if a few states are coordinating, does the potential utility of or cost savings of telemedicine that might justify a huge rehashing of the medical licensing system in general? Yeah, and I think the markets are going to answer that question, and I think they have been answering it, uh, albeit slowly, but that will gain steam. And they've been saying yes, absolutely. I honestly think Kyle nailed it when she said that this may become a part of the standard of care. You know, go forward 30 years in the future, and I suspect a good portion of routine testing will be automated. You know, you'll be showing up, 
you sign in with some kind of uh, retina scan. The thing takes your blood from the end of your finger and runs it through some tests. You don't have to have blood drawings. You don't have to see a nurse. You don't have to see anything. It's all automated. So Very interesting points. Yeah, down the road. I mean, that's that's the way it's going to go. There's, there's nothing wrong with policy here getting ahead of the tech. Too often, we suffer because it's the other way around, where the policy lags the technology causes issues in society. But right now, it seems like the policy is way ahead of the tech. So, you know, let it roll. Assuming, right, assuming we can get everyone on the same page, as was the major gripe of uh, the doctors in the survey. And so, I mean, we, we can see currently, you're absolutely right, policy needs to be changed to support the technology in this case. You know, there's a bit of a sluggish bureaucracy potentially going on now in this case and maybe in other cases. So if you can't take care of your patient from afar because of, you know, sluggish bureaucracy, Mike, why not go out and buy some bullets to blow off some steam? Well, the short answer, Paul, is because you are no longer allowed. Let's talk about the AR-15 bullet ban executed by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. So the ATF, by executive action, plans to ban the sale of 5.56 millimeter bullets most commonly used in AR-15 long rifles. Uh, since these are rifle rounds, they easily pierce police body armor, which normally only stops 9 millimeter rounds. Okay, Now, for the folks who uh, don't have the level of understanding... You should at least know the difference between a rifle and a pistol. 9mm is most commonly a pistol round. 5.56mm is most commonly a rifle round. However, new pistols have been introduced which use 5.56mm rounds. These are faster bullets. Now, that means it will uh, pierce police armor. Now, that gives the ATF the opportunity to make the case that they they are now armor-piercing bullets. So they want to reclassify those bullets as armor-piercing. Now, that gives the White House cover in directing a ban of these bullets for sale. Now, this White House was unable to generate enough political pressure to force gun ban legislation despite well-funded campaigns by the anti-gun lobby, including generous financial backing by Michael Bloomberg. Regulation is their next best option. And since they can't regulate guns at large, they see further restrictions on the sale of ammunition as a means to an end. A gun without ammunition is useless, an additional regulation on ammunition that creates a scarcity that renders many weapons useless creates a de facto gun ban. So the first big question, of course we all want safe police, but in light of elitist two-party power sharing, is it right for some people to come down on this on the side that gives advantage to the state instead of the people? And, and Nick, I'd like you to take that one because I, I really want your perspective on it. Well, I mean, I think for me, the first thing to say is, you know, I'm not all that concerned about safe police. I don't want to join in that chorus of, oh, we all want safe police. Um, but that's, I, I guess my response really, if you'd have asked me, say, a year ago, I would have said, yes, great, awesome move, less guns is the answer, I'm for that, I, and I would have been, would have been right there. Um but I got to say, you know, my mind has been changed a lot by, you know, I mean, just how how much publicity has been given to a torrent. I mean, I think that's the right word, a torrent of stories of unarmed, slightly armed, ambiguously armed ethnic people, especially black young men in this country, being gunned down by police. You know, and maybe it was just one of those things that as a white person, I was more blind to than I should have been. And, you know, of course, is there media complicity? Sure. But um, given how much impunity the police have to murder citizens, you know, I, I got to say, I'm I'm probably I'm, I'm probably more on your side of, of this one, Mike, that, you know, we we should not be banning ammunition. I'm not for things that take um, effective defense out of the hands of citizens. Yeah, no, that's an interesting perspective. Kyle, let me ask you, is he is the Obama administration here just working a loophole in our laws to get something done for which there is limited, if any, uh, political legislative will? I mean, even even folks like Nick have been changing their minds uh, against banning ammunition and banning weapons. So is that what they're doing? I tend to lean towards anything the Obama administration is doing is working a loophole in our laws to get something done that he prefers. So I would say absolutely. I might also be diving into our last segment here with conspiracy theories, so I'll keep it brief. I think he wants a country that's equal to others and stripping away some of our basic foundations that the country was built on. And I realize that, you know, the Second Amendment is the right to bear arms for a militia 
and that sort of thing. But has it has it changed and grown since then? Absolutely. And I think that this is one way to take guns out of the hands of the people. And I think it's completely to, to put us at their mercy of a police state. So, Paul, does the concept of reducing citizens' rights to promote officer safety at any point become a catch-all argument that can be applied to any situation as a means to roll back constitutional rights? Well, I mean... I'm going to actually disagree with you guys and, and just start out by saying, you know, I, I think what's happened recently has been uh, kind of a local pocket of activity. And I still um, I, I don't think that this is going to be a catch all for constitutional rights in general. Uh, I think I think the idea for for, uh, for Americans to each individually own a gun is uh, is wrong. I mean, if you look at other countries, if you look at the U.K., Australia, uh, if you look at um, Germany, they have very strict gun laws, right? And they also have um, much less liability for you to be killed by, by a gun, right? I think you're about 1 in 50 times likely to be killed in, um, to, uh, to, to have a gun death in, um, in the UK compared to in the USA. And I think, you know, I think what's happened recently is shifting people's minds, but I still think it's a larger question of culture, gun culture. We can't promote a gun culture or we get to a detente situation where, oh, you know, we have to now fight back against the, the police. No, in general, we all have to kind of step back and say, you know, guns are dangerous. Gun manufacturers, I think, are dangerous and are providing uh, tools that are completely detrimental. And so I, I, I think in general for constitutional rights, it's a separate argument. I don't think so. I want to ask Nick kind of along the same lines, and I'd like to stay on officer safety. Where is the line that delineates officer safety from a citizen's constitutional rights? Where do we draw that? I mean, is it to, to maintain 100% officer safety uh, during a routine traffic stop? Do we need to start removing everybody from the car and handcuffing them on the side of the road just in case – there was, uh, you know, somebody had a, a weapon at some point ever. I, I think you get what I'm asking. Uh, you, you know, where do you think that line lies, Nick? This is honestly, this is a very tough question. And I, and I would say I have, I would have two different answers to this question. You know, one based on the existence of a, a hypothetical society wherein there were, uh, you know, political and economic and social justice and one more appropriate to the one that we live in. You know, the one that we live in, I mean, sort of the latter, the cops are just thugs of the ruling class. They're here to police the proletariat and make sure there is not too much uh, rabble rousing. And so I'm honestly not that concerned at all about officer safety. The thugs of the ruling class will do as they do. Um, you know, what is the old saying goes, right? The powerful do as they will and the weak suffer what they must. And so, you know, until there's a, uh, a power change, you know, we're, we're at the mercy of the police. If we, if we had a, a just society, I'll say briefly, that, you know, if this were a just society, I think there's a lot we could do for officer safety. But at the same time, I think if you're an officer, you're putting yourself like a soldier very much in harm's way. And there is no way to guarantee safety. It's an inherently risky occupation. Although I think even the, uh, I think the, the, the risks are often overstated by the, the pro police media and the police unions. Right. Right. No, that and that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. I mean, the, the job of the officer is inherently dangerous uh, in its composition. So, you know, Paul, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, we've been talking about the Obama administration using the fact that this ammunition can now be used for pistols as the justification for this. And does this all change if pistols weren't in the equation and we were just talking about open carry of long guns? You know, is that is that a better or worse situation? Well, of course, I mean, you know, you know, my opinion, I think that I think that open carry should be should be illegal. I think that closed carry should be illegal. So, of course, you know, if we were just talking about open carry of long guns, yeah, in general, you know, on the surface, it might seem uh, it might seem safer. But I think in, overall, it's a worse situation because you're in the end, you know, uh, contributing to this culture of, of uh, being able to personally carry a weapon that is. An assault rifle, you know. My only rebuttal to that is that the the ammunition hasn't changed. All you've done is use it in one type of weapon versus another. I mean, the police, if there was a risk to the to the police officer, and that was truly the intent, then the the exposure that the police officer faces uh, wouldn't necessarily change. So I guess in my mind that kind of modified it. I, I see that in yours it doesn't. Um, let me ask my last question to Kyle. Uh, will this kind of ammunition classification survive the Obama administration if a Democrat wins the White House next year? And and also, you know, what if a Republican wins? Is it going to last or is it going to be reversed? Oh, honestly, I think it depends on the Democrat. Um, if it's a Republican, I don't think so. I think that it's there's too much ingrained in the fiber of Americans to believe that 
that that's something that you should have. And um, the Republican Party, that's what they, they kind of base a lot of their foundation on. So I think it would almost be they'd have to, even if they didn't agree with it. With a Democrat, I, I think it depends on how far they want to distance themselves from Obama um, and this administration. I mean, if they're trying to, you know, to, to make sure and say, hey, I'm a Democrat, but it's not his party, it's not his administration, I'm really doing something different. I mean, I think that would be one of the only platforms you can really run on right now uh, as a Democrat, or at least I would hope. But, you know, that's that's my personal opinion. And, you know, as a gun owner, I am comfortable having open carry, and I feel like, you know, I, I totally appreciate the statistics in other countries, but um, I would I would hope that regardless of who it is, that this classification doesn't survive. Okay, great. Well, guys, you're going to love this transition. Ready? From shooting down range to shooting down planes. Nick, do you know what time it is? I do. And now it's time for the conspiracy of the week. There's a conspiracy out there. You know what I'm saying? There's a conspiracy. A C O N conspiracy. All right. Welcome to this week's conspiracy of the week. Mike, I, I'm, I'm excited about this one. Can I just say, I mean, this might be a little bit dated. I know it's not really in the press, but, you know, when the, the last, you know, Malaysia Airlines plane in the, I don't know, Indonesian Triangle, we can call it now. I don't know. It made me, you know, look at some of these other conspiracy theories with some of the other planes that had crashed recently. Uh, and some of the ones that stood out to me were about the MH17 crash. Uh, and so, of course, right, to refresh everyone's memory, MH17 was the plane that crashed in uh, eastern Ukraine, killing everyone on board. So, of course, most of the conspiracy theories in this one focus on basically, right, whether the Kiev government did it or did the, the Donbass rebels shoot it down, right? Was it – did the, did Kiev shoot it down to make the pro-Russian side look bad, right? Was it the Kiev government shooting at Putin, right? Uh, and, of course, right, you could certainly see in a, in a very tense situation that both sides would have reason to – Right, attempt a, a kind of, you know, false flag operation here and, you know, gain the propaganda coup and, and portray the other side negatively. Right. So there's a lot of that going around. And of course, as, as always, there are the people who are claiming, Oh, the Illuminati did it or, uh, you know, it was a false, <laughs> you know, it was actually a false flag and, you know, Obama did it to distract from the, uh, the immigration crisis at the border or, Thanks, uh, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Obama, hashtag. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, one of the other good ones I read was that, um, again, bringing it back to Bibi, that the, the Biebs did it, that Israel disappeared MH370 um, and then changed it up to make it look like a different plane, flew it over Ukraine and blew it up um, basically to basically try to make, make Russia look bad because Israel wants to destroy the Zionists, want to destroy Russia. Because Russia is the the quote, and this, this was the report. This was in the report I read. The quote, last bastion of the white race. Uh, hmm. You know, so so there's so there's some weird stuff going on around uh, uh, this this sort of crash. It really uh, really I, covers I the spread. Today, yeah, it goes everywhere. But I want to talk about my favorite one in particular. This one I think is great. So one of these ones, and it's big in Russia right now, is that basically everyone on the plane was already dead. Bum, like, bum, bum, like, right, the, like, like the TV right, show Lost. Exactly. Thank you. That's and what happened to the plane. That the, the, you know, Charles Widmore style, the Western powers, um, basically, MH370 was diverted to Pakistan or to wherever you like, uh, taken by plane, or sorry, taken by ship, ferried to Holland, filled up with corpses, intentionally flown over Ukraine where it was, right, i.e. either, uh, intentionally shot down or, or detonated with charges, uh, you know, whatever you want to believe. Uh, and of course, right, it was all done for propaganda purposes to uh, to blame Russia. Uh, and so I got to say this one, I, when I came across this one, I really, I wanted to do it this week because uh, I think that one is just, it's too good because of the, again, the crazy uh, life imitating art, if you will. Nick, have <laughs> they considered the possibility that it was snakes on the plane that caused these fatalities? <laughs> You know, I gotta say that is literally the one thing I haven't seen be accused of crashing. I mean, I even saw one. I, I mean, get this: somebody even thinks that the plane MH370 was shot down uh, to prevent the announcement of a cure for AIDS. 
Um, and the reports were that, you know, everyone on, you know, all 200 or whatever passengers were all these high level AIDS specialists on their way to an AIDS conference and they were going to announce that AIDS was cured. Uh, and, but of course the, you know, the Jews or the Illumina or whoever doesn't want AIDS to be cured, uh, shot this kid. plane down. It, it came out later that like the number of actual AIDS researchers on this plane was not like 200, but you know, 14, 22, something, you know what I mean? Just the Something average like that. population percentage of AIDS researchers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are more than average because they were going to a, they were all going to this conference. But like, it was not a, an entire plane. Like, the original report was that literally everyone on the plane. This was like the plane full of the best AIDS scientists all over the world, who were all conveniently again lost style assembled on one plane for their destiny to be shot down. That's well, absolutely I think they're all still ridiculous. Alive. They're hanging out with Tupac. You know, they're hanging out with Jimmy Hoffa. And Jimmy Hoffa. Putin's, you know, giving them the finest vodka. You see, eating, eating fish with Jacob. Well, uh, well, apparently, you know, I, that makes sense because, it, uh, what did you say, Nick? It is the last bastion of the white race. According to this report, I, I, I laughed out loud when I read that sentence. Because, like, if you, if you talk to most, like, Hitlerites, don't most of them hate the Slavs? Like, most of them consider Slavs, like... Like Hitler, anyway, thought they were the you know the underhumans, right? I mean, so some it, kind it's of, sort of yeah. it's sort of weird to read that they are the last bastion of the white race. I mean, I was thinking more like Denmark or something. Yeah, only only the Germans and the Scandinavians, right? You know, yeah, the isn't, that, isn't that it? <laughs> I think yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, well, I, I like the you know, Mike, I like the theory of uh, you know snakes on the plane here because uh, we can we can be convinced that Samuel Jackson was involved and clearly he's involved in this actual real life conspiracy. <laughs> Nick, who did the it? Head of the Illuminati. The head of yeah, the Illuminati. Yeah, he's to hide in plain sight, right? That's right. That's right. So he know? keeps making these movies, telling us, and we just don't believe it. <laughs> Kyle, that's exactly right. Well, guys, it sounds like we got to the bottom of another good one. Absolutely. I'm afraid that is all the time we have this week. Thank you for listening to Gorilla Roundtable. Remember, go follow us on the Twitter. You can catch up with all of our exploits and discussions and arguments between shows. Yeah, so you can also find this and previous Gorilla Roundtable episodes on our YouTube channel and also on our RSS feed on iTunes. Uh, download it to your podcast app. And very soon, our website will be up and running. Full force, 100%, GorillaRoundtable.com. Okay, folks, adios. We'll be back next week. He was big and fat and gray and old, and I looked at him and my blood ran cold. I said, my name is Sue.